The year is 2007, and the New York Giants enter the season with nobody expecting them to have much success. They were coming off of a season where they won just as many games as they had lost, and although they still managed to sneak into the playoffs, it ended in a heartbreaking loss. They also lost one of the league's best running backs, who was doing all he could to carry the team, and now the team had to be led by a young quarterback, who was talented but turnover prone. The media had little to no faith in their head coach and his job security was a major topic of conversation. But somehow, the Giants managed to stay focused. Having good players at almost all of their skill positions on offense, plus a talented and physical defense, the Giants managed to overcome the sometimes overwhelming New York media attacks, a slow start, a playoff schedule that worked against them, and a battle with possibly the greatest team of all time to pull off one of the most unlikely championship runs in sports history. Here is the story of the 2007 New York Giants. In the 2006 season, the Giants were expected to do well, seeing how they won the division the year before and were returning most of their key pieces. The first half of their season, they got off to a strong start, going 6-2. Then, in week 10, against the Bears, the Giants were in the middle of a comeback when down four, kicker Jay Feely came out onto the field to kick a 51-yard field goal, which normally wouldn't be a big deal, but today, he would be attempting to kick into 25 mile an hour wind gusts. The Bears knew this was a risk, so they placed star returner Devin Hester in the back of the end zone to field the kick, just in case. This paid off because the kick never made it through the goalpost, and once Hester caught it, the Giants made the mistake of starting to walk off the field before the whistle blew, which caused Hester to return the kick 108 yards for the longest touchdown in NFL history. This play killed the Giants' comeback and was a spark to their four-game losing streak. Another crucial loss was when the Giants lost to the Titans in Week 12. It wasn't just that they lost, it was the manner in which they lost. They went into the fourth quarter up 21-0 when the Titans began to come back. With 2 minutes and 45 seconds left on the clock, it was 4th and 10, and the Titans had the ball on their own 23-yard line, and Matthias Kiwanuka had a clear shot at a sack that would have ended the game, but he let the quarterback go, apparently thinking that the play was dead, which led to Vince Young scrambling and gaining 19 yards on the run, keeping the drive alive. The Titans ended up tying the game, and in the following drive, Eli Manning threw an interception to Pac-Man Jones which led to a Titans field goal and another loss for the Giants. Injuries, countless costly mistakes, and a few in-house distractions, more on that in a few, caused the Giants to go on a major skid, finishing the season 8-8 eight eight after starting off 6-2. Somehow, they still barely managed to get into the playoffs, becoming the 8th team in NFL history to finish 8-8 eight and, eight and still make the playoffs. Regardless of the record, they made it there and they faced off against their division rival, Philadelphia Eagles. It was a competitive back and forth game that ultimately ended with the Eagles kicking the game winning field goal as time expired, ending the Giants long roller coaster season. During that 2006 season, the Giants primary offensive weapon was veteran tailback Tiki Barber. Barber was drafted to the Giants in the second round of the 1997 draft. The original intentions for him was to be a third down, change of pace back, but he managed to work his way in and out of the starting spot for his first three seasons before becoming the full-time starter in the 2000 season in which the Giants made their way to the Super Bowl before losing to the Ravens. After this season, due to his effectiveness and his playmaking ability in the run and in the pass game, the Giants signed him to a six-year deal which made him quote, the happiest man in New York. From here, Barber never looked back. He became one of the best backs in the league. From 2000 to 2006, no running back in the NFL had more rushing yards than him, and in 2006, although he was turning 31, he seemed to be entering his prime, finishing the year with 1,662 rushing yards and over 2,000 total yards. But in the middle of the season, while the Giants were off to a great start, Barber announced to the press that he was going to retire at the end of the season to pursue a career in broadcasting also saying that he lost his heart to play the game. If that wasn't enough of a distraction, he also spent the season throwing shots at the team's head coach, Tom Coughlin. Through all of this, 
Barber managed to play well and make it to the Pro Bowl, but the Giants fell short of a championship, and when the season was done, they lost one of the league's best players as Barber retired. After a distraction-filled, injury-riddled roller coaster of a season, the Giants entered the 2007 season with a clean sleep, just hoping to stay healthy and have better team chemistry. Honestly, a championship wasn't exactly the most realistic expectation for the Giants this season, as they weren't even expected to make the playoffs. Media outlets in New York, serious or not, were quoted as saying the Giants might even do bad enough to get the first pick in the upcoming NFL draft. While that seemed like a bit of an exaggeration, it was understandable why expectations weren't that high for them. The Giants finished 8-8 eight eight the year before, and they didn't make any major moves in this offseason. Then, they lost their best player on offense, and arguably their best player on defense, Michael Strahan, was holding out for a new contract and missed training camp in all of the preseason. How could anybody think that they would have a better year? Well, let's look at some of the Giants' key players for the year. Starting at quarterback was Eli Manning. Eli, the younger brother of All-Pro Peyton Manning, was drafted number one in the 2004 draft, and his draft situation was actually pretty interesting. Going into the draft, after a notable career at Ole Miss, Manning was the clear-cut number one pick. The Chargers were the team that had the number one pick, but Eli and his father made it very clear that Eli didn't want to play for the Chargers, saying that if the Chargers were to draft him, then he would just sit out. When it came time for the Chargers to make their pick, they still selected Eli, and you can see the displeasure all over his face. Yikes. But then, three picks later, the Giants with the fourth pick selected quarterback Phillip Rivers from NC State, and a trade was made where the Giants traded Rivers and three future draft picks to the Chargers for Eli Manning, and all parties ended up happy. Eli started off his career in 04 as the backup to Super Bowl winning Kurt Warner, but Warner was only on a one-year deal, and the Giants had already bet the house on Eli, trading all of those draft picks for him, so they knew that he was the future, and halfway through the 04 season, Manning became the starter. He proved to be competent, just a little turnover prone, throwing for six touchdowns, but nine interceptions. His first full season as a starter, 2005, he helped lead the Giants to a division title, but he threw three interceptions in a playoff loss to the Panthers and finished the year with 17 interceptions. And in the 06 season, as mentioned earlier, Eli barely got his team into the playoffs, where they suffered a heartbreaking loss, and then he had to watch his big brother Peyton go on and win the Super Bowl. So now, in the 07 season, with a few years under his belt, and with Tiki Barber out, Eli is looking to make a statement as a clear-cut leader of the offense. Speaking of Barber, at the start of the season, Barber made some comments questioning Eli's leadership when they played together, calling his efforts comical, which Eli just brushed off. At running back, the Giants had Brandon Jacobs, the big burly back drafted out of Southern Illinois University in the fourth round of the 05 draft. Up until this point, Jacobs was the backup to Tiki Barber, being used mostly in short yardage and goal line situations when the Giants needed someone to punch in a one or two yard touchdown. At 6'4", 265 pounds, Jacobs was the perfect person to fill this role, but now that Tiki had retired, Jacobs, who was now in his third season, was ready to take over the starting running back position, and now Jacobs had a solid backup option and fourth year back Derek Ward. At wide receiver was Plaxico Burris, in his third season with the Giants after spending his first five years with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Standing at 6'5", Burris was a huge target and quickly became Eli Manning's favorite target. On the other side at receiver was veteran Amani Tuma. Tuma was going into his 11th season, all with the Giants, and he was the primary receiver before Plaxico got there, but he was no slouch at the position, although he was coming off of a torn ACL the season prior. On defense, probably the most vital part of this whole Giants roster was their stout front four, starring Justin Tuck, third year player out of Notre Dame, OCU Minura, the fifth year player out of Auburn, Fred Robbins, the eighth year player out of Wake Forest, and Captain Michael Strahan, going into his 15th year, who was the veteran of the unit in the face of the Giants. Although Strahan did hold out for a new contract and missed training camp in the preseason, threatening retirement, Strahan and the Giants came to an agreement for at least one more season, 
so he would be ready in time for the start of the season. As a unit, their pass rushes made quarterbacks in the league uncomfortable in the past, and this year they were ready to continue what they did best. And let's not forget about head coach Tom Coughlin. Coach Coughlin was entering his third year as a Giants head coach. This was actually his second stint with the Giants, as he was an assistant to head coach Bill Parcells from 88 to 91, helping the Giants win the 91 Super Bowl. After that season, he became the head coach at Boston College for a few years, where he turned them into a consistent winner. Then, in 95, the NFL introduced a brand new team, the Jacksonville Jaguars, and hired Coughlin as their first ever head coach. In eight seasons with Coughlin at the helm, the Jaguars became the most successful expansion team in NFL history. They managed a streak of four straight playoff appearances, including going to the AFC Championship game twice. Not bad at all. After a 6-10 finish in the 2002 season, the Jags owner Wayne Weaver fired Coughlin, which he later admitted was one of his biggest regrets when he sold the team. Coughlin would take a year off, then in 2004, the Giants would hire him in the offseason, and his first move was a draft day trade for Eli Manning. His next best move was subtle, but drastic. Tiki Barber, while he was a great running back, had a huge fumbling problem, fumbling 16 times from 2002 to 2004, losing 12 of them. He couldn't hold on to the ball to save his life. Coughlin came in and had Tiki change the way he carried the ball, and in 05 and 06, Barber only lost two fumbles. Despite turning the Giants around with his clear coaching prowess, the harsh New York media wouldn't let up on Coach Coughlin, especially in 2006. With such high expectations for the season and the Giants not living up to those expectations, Coughlin got much of the blame and fans started to grow impatient as well, chanting, Fire Coughlin, in a loss against the Saints. If that's not bad enough, Tiki Barber began to publicly criticize Coughlin, saying they should be running the ball more. Now mind you, this was after he got a career high total in carries and in yards. Sounds pretty ungrateful if you ask me. But then, all pro tight end Jeremy Shockey took a sneaky shot at Coughlin in the blowout loss of the Seahawks, saying the Giants were outplayed and outcoached. After all these shots, and with Coughlin on the last year of his deal in 06, the Giants management were unsure if they would bring him back for the 2007 season but finally decided to sign him on for one more year, which would have him on the hot seat for the year. With this added pressure, plus the fact that they were being overlooked going into the season, Tom Coughlin and the New York Giants came into 07 ready to make a statement. The 2007 season started off a little rocky for the Giants. In their first game of the season, they lost to their division rival Dallas Cowboys, and they left that game with injuries to key players O.C. Umanura, Brandon Jacobs, and Eli Manning. The next game, they lost their home opener to the Green Bay Packers. Now the Giants are at 0-2 for the first time since the 1996 season, and they've already given up 80 total points in those two losses. Week 3 comes, and the Giants are going against the Redskins. By halftime, the Giants are down 17-3 and it looks like they're about to start the season 0-3, and all hope is starting to go down the drain. But then, going into the second half, Eli Manning helped turn the offense around and led a Giants comeback. They wound up in the lead 24-17, but in the final moments of the game, Washington ended up in a first down on the Giants' goal line. So they had four chances to gain one yard to tie the game, but the Giants held tough, stopping running back Liddell Betts from scoring on the fourth down in the final seconds of the game. This was the spark that they needed. Thanks to a strong run game and dominant pass rushing, they would go on to win their next six games to get their record to 6-2 going into their bye week. The win streak ended when the Cowboys came to the Giants stadium and beat them 31-20, which is now the second time the Giants lost to the Cowboys on the year. They would rebound and beat the Lions, but in that game, they would lose pass rusher Matthias Kiwanuka for the year when he broke his fibula. Their next game was at home against the 4-6 Minnesota Vikings, and this would be an interesting matchup because the Vikings had the best run defense in the league, and the Giants star running back Brandon Jacobs would be out for this game, but the Giants still had Eli Manning. Well, Eli would have the worst game of the season, going 21-49 for and throwing four interceptions in which three of them were returned for touchdowns as the Giants lost 41-17. to 
This was an embarrassing performance, and it was worse because although the Vikings had the best run defense, they had the worst pass defense. Not only that, but their starting cornerback, Antoine Winfield, was out for the game. This was the Giants' worst home loss since 1999. After the game, Eli would earn himself the nickname, Eli the Terrible. Not the most creative nickname, but the point was made. Coach Coughlin clearly didn't approve of Eli's play in the game, saying, you can't win if you're just handing the ball to the guy across the field. Now remember, the season before this, the Giants started off 6-2, just like this season, but they finished off 8-8. Eight eight. Is this season going to be the same? After the blowout loss to the Vikings, people were starting to question if Eli could carry the Giants and doubted their ability to finish a season strong. Well, those doubts seemed to disappear when the Giants won three of their next four games, including their Week 16 win where they went into Buffalo and beat the Bills 38-21, where they improved their record 10-5 to clinch a playoff spot with still one more game to play. This game was also key because it was their seventh straight road win and it also marked the emergence of Ahmad Bradshaw. In Week 13 against the Chicago Bears, the Giants' other running back, Derek Ward, broke his fibula and was ruled out for the season. Although the Giants still had Brandon Jacobs, their run scheme revolved around them having another back that was used for a change of pace, which was Ward's rule. With Ward out, Bradshaw, who was a rookie drafted in the seventh round out of Marshall, was able to get some touches as a change of pace back. After just playing mostly on special teams and in the week 16 win against the Bills, he carried the ball 17 times for 151 yards, including an 88 yard touchdown run, which was the third longest run in Giants history. This was crucial because the Giants run game was a big part of their team and now with Bradshaw proving to be a viable option, they wouldn't miss a beat. Although they already clinched the playoffs, the Giants had one more game to play and it was an important one. The undefeated New England Patriots would be coming to town. Coughlin decided to play all of his starters in this game, which baffled fans and media alike because the game was almost meaningless. Not only did the Giants already clinch the playoffs, but they also already clinched the fifth seed, so this game wouldn't affect their playoff positioning. Playing his starters in this game would risk one of the players getting hurt going into the playoffs, like Plaxico Burris, who was already banged up with a bad ankle. But Coughlin stood firm in his decision and all his stars played. The Giants played inspired, with a dominant pass rush and a run game that was having their way with the Patriots defense. They found themselves up 28-16 in the third quarter, which was the position the Patriots hadn't been in for the whole year. The Pats would come back in the fourth quarter and the Giants would end up losing the game 38-35 in a dramatic head-to-head. -head. Their final record on the season was 10-6 and now it was on to the playoffs. Their first playoff game, they went into Tampa Bay to face off with the Buccaneers. They got off to a slow start, going down 7-0 and gaining negative two yards on offense in the first quarter. But by halftime, they were up 14-7, thanks to a few second half interceptions by the defense and stellar play by Eli Manning, the Giants would win the game 24-14, and waiting for them for their next game would be their division rival, Dallas Cowboys. So now we're in Dallas. This is the third time this season that these two teams are facing each other. Dallas won the first two matchups and finished with the best record in the NFC, but the Giants have now won eight straight road games, and actually, the last time they lost on the road was to the Dallas Cowboys. Dallas was also coming off of a first round bye week, meaning they had two weeks to prepare for this game. The odds weren't in the Giants' favor. The game would start off with the Cowboys having long, time-consuming drives for scores, but the Giants would answer with quick touchdowns on their end. By halftime, the score was tied 14-14. The second half was all defense, as the Giants' pass rush began to take over. Dallas quarterback Tony Romo was hit a total of nine times in the game, and in the second half, he couldn't get any breathing room, rushing throws, being chased out of the pocket, and getting completely rattled. Brandon Jacobs would end up scoring the go-ahead touchdown with 13 minutes left in the game, where it seemed like there was enough time on the clock for Dallas to score, but their offense couldn't catch a break. Although the Giants' pass rush was putting heavy pressure on Tony Romo, they didn't record any sacks until the fourth quarter, where they had two crucial ones as the Cowboys were trying to take the lead, which was perfect timing. 
Giants quarterback R.W. McQuarters intercepted a Romo pass with 9 seconds left in the game to seal the victory and the Giants won 21-17. Another road win for the resilient Giants. Next, the Giants would travel to Lambeau Field to go against the Green Bay Packers to battle for the crown of the NFC. Beating the Cowboys helped the Giants gain some respect, but the Packers were still the favorite. This game was set to be an intense matchup as the Packers had never lost an NFC Championship game at home, but the Giants have now won 9 consecutive road games. Something had to give. Green Bay also had a little bit of extra inspiration because this was supposed to be quarterback Brett Favre's last season so he wanted to go out with the championship. The temperature was below zero with a negative 23 degree wind chill, making this the third coldest game of all time. But the game still had to be played. The Giants would make a few plays in the first half, but the Packers defense held up at the right times, only allowing two field goals, but the Giants defense were doing well too, giving up one big play that led to a touchdown and an additional field goal. Halftime, the score was at 10 to six, Packers lead. Right as the third quarter started, the Giants would score a touchdown, Green Bay would respond with a touchdown, just for the Giants to answer right away with another touchdown. Now they're in the lead, 20-17, with three minutes left to go in the third quarter. The fourth quarter was filled with mistakes by the Giants, with cornerback R.W. McCordis fumbling twice, once on an interception, which led to a field goal that tied the game, and another on a punt return. Then there was a 48-yard touchdown run by Armand Bradshaw that was negated by a holding penalty. And of course, kicker Lawrence Times went on to miss two field goals, including the last play of regulation, which was a 36-yard attempt that didn't even make it close to being good. Enter overtime. The score is tied 20-20. At the time, the rule in the NFL was that in overtime, the first team to score wins the game. So the team that wins the coin toss has a major advantage to win. The Packers would win the toss and get the first chance to win the game. So earlier in the game, for the Packers' first touchdown, Favre threw a 90-yard touchdown pass to his favorite target, Donald Driver. This touchdown was made possible by cornerback Corey Webster. Corey Webster was in his third season with the Giants, drafted out of LSU. He couldn't find consistent footing as a starter due to inconsistent play, and in this 2007 season, he was completely removed from the starting lineup and limited to special teams after poor performance in the early games of the season. During week 16 against the Bills, Webster redeemed himself when he caught an interception and returned it for a touchdown to seal the game, which clinched the playoff spot for the Giants. Going into the playoffs, he became the Giants starting cornerback, and he's been performing well in these playoffs, getting an interception in the end zone in the wild card game versus the Buccaneers, plus recovering a fumble in the same game. Next game against the Cowboys, he almost completely shut down one of the best receivers in the league, All-Pro Terrell Owens. So now, against the Packers, after giving up the longest touchdown pass in Packers history, Webster was looking to redeem himself again. On the second play of the drive, Brett Favre dropped back and went to make a throw to Donald Driver on the play that worked twice before, but Webster managed to grab the interception and ran the ball into the Packers' territory. This was possibly Brett Favre's last pass as a Packer. Giants failed to convert on third down and kicker Lawrence Tynes ran onto the field because he also wanted to redeem himself after missing two field goals earlier in the game, but no kicker has ever made a field goal over 40 yards when the temperature was below zero, and this attempt was for 47 yards. When he kicked it, it looked like it was no good when it started to go off wide right, but the wind would pull it back to the left and the kick made it just over the goalpost. Giants win 23-20. They are now the NFC champions, and Coach Coughlin now has frostbite. Eli Manning, despite leading the league in interceptions during the regular season, has so far gone each playoff game with no interceptions. The Giants still had one more game ahead of them, and it wouldn't be an easy one. There was still one more team waiting for them. They made it. Against all odds, the Giants actually made their way to the Super Bowl. Their first Super Bowl appearance since the 2000 season, where they got destroyed by the Ravens. So far, this playoff run was magical, but they need to keep the magic going for one more game, which wasn't going to be easy. On the other side of the field was the undefeated New England Patriots. 
The Patriots were 18-0, looking to make history, having one of the most dominant seasons of all time. Quarterback Tom Brady, who was already three championships deep into his career, was having by far his best season yet, thanks to two special additions to the team. They nabbed wide receiver Wes Welker from their rival Miami Dolphins and completely stole wide receiver Randy Moss from the Oakland Raiders. Moss was widely regarded as the best receiver in the NFL to start his career when he was with the Vikings, being possibly the best deep threat of all time, standing at 6'4 with alleged 4'2 speed and a 48 inch vertical and great hands. But in 05 and 06, while he was with the Raiders, he was playing a bit uninspired and around the league teams and media thought he had lost a step. Boy, were they wrong. Moss was traded to New England for a bag of chips and now for the first time in his career, Tom Brady had a bona fide number one receiver. Moss went back to being the NFL's biggest deep threat, drawing double teams for the whole season and still scoring on 23 touchdown receptions, a record by the way which opened things up for Wes Welker underneath, leading to Welker leading the NFL in receptions with 112. Brady also broke the record for touchdown passes in the season with 50, and that's just on offense. The Patriots also had a top five ranked defense on the season. All around greatness. With Bill Belichick at head coach, the team broke a lot of records this year. Since 1978, when the NFL expanded the schedule to 16 games, the Patriots were the only team to finish the regular season undefeated, and the games weren't close either, winning their games by an average of 19 points. Actually, they had three close calls. Three teams in the regular season came close to beating the Patriots, only losing by three points. The Eagles in Week 12 lost 31-28, the Ravens the following week lost 27-24, and of course, in the last game of the season, the Giants lost 38-35. In all of these games, a strategy was formed. Run the ball to the point that you control the clock so the Patriots don't have as many chances to score, and then when the Patriots do have the ball, get to Tom Brady, and that will disrupt their offense. The Giants obviously knew this from their meeting against them in the regular season, where people told Colts Coughlin he was a fool for playing his starters, but now he knows exactly what he needs to do for his team to pull off the upset. Going into this game, the Patriots were heavily favored, and rightfully so, seeing how they were undefeated and many thought the Giants weren't even supposed to be there. But games aren't decided by odds and the Giants were ready for this one. They knew the formula to beat the Patriots was to get the Brady and they had the personnel to do so, leading the NFL in the regular season with 53 sacks. The Giants got the ball first and they started off with the longest drive in Super Bowl history, going 16 plays for 77 yards, converting on four third downs, which was also a Super Bowl record, and taking 10 minutes off the clock. The drive would only end in a field goal, but it took up nearly the whole first quarter. The following drive, the Patriots would score on a touchdown run by Lawrence Maroney in the beginning of the second quarter. For the rest of the half, Eli and the Giants had the ball for over 8 minutes total, but couldn't get much going. The Patriots weren't having much luck either, with Brady getting sacked 3 times in the second quarter, including one at the end of the quarter, where Justin Tuck hit him and forced a fumble on the Giants 44 yard line where the Giants recovered it. The Giants entered halftime down 7-3, but they're controlling the ball and they're putting relentless pressure on Brady, not letting the Patriots gain any momentum on offense, so their confidence is high. To start the third quarter, the Patriots had a long drive of their own going 16 plays for 48 yards, taking a little over 9 minutes off the clock, when Coach Belichick might have gotten a little too cocky going for it on 4th down with 13 yards to go, which ended in an incomplete pass. The Giants pass rush was being so disruptive that the Patriots linemen started to get a little jumpy and got called for three false starts in the third quarter alone. Neither team scored in the third. The Giants would score on their first drive of the fourth quarter and now they had the lead 10-7. The next few drives would be uneventful until the Patriots finally scored again on a touchdown pass to a relatively quiet Randy Moss with 2 minutes and 45 seconds left in the game. The Giants got the ball on their own 17 yard line down 14-10 with 2 minutes and 40 seconds left. A few quick plays brought them to the 44-yard line and is now third down with a minute and 15 seconds left to play. Time was running out and the Patriots only needed two more stops to close the game. Then, one of the biggest plays in Super Bowl history was made. Eli Manning would barely escape the grasp of three Patriots defenders and threw it up for grabs to wide receiver David Tyree. 
all pro safety Rodney Harrison was there to break up the pass, but somehow Tyree was able to hold on to the catch by pressing the ball onto his helmet and just barely avoided the ball touching the ground for a first down and 32 yard game. With 58 seconds left to play and down by four, the Giants still needed to score a touchdown to take the lead and they did just that. Plastico Burris ended up getting behind cornerback Ellis Hobbs and Eli found him for a touchdown with 39 seconds left on the clock and the game was basically over. The Patriots would get the ball back but didn't have enough time and weren't able to gain a single yard as the Giants pulled up the ultimate upset. From the beginning of the playoffs until now, the Giants were doubted in every game. Each game had to be played on the road but it didn't matter. Each quarterback face was supposed to be better than Eli Manning but it didn't matter. Eli outplayed all of them as the Giants went on the road four times as the underdog and won all four games, ending on what was probably the biggest upset in sports history. Coach Tom Coughlin, in what was almost his last season as the Giants coach, managed to pull off the unthinkable and now has earned himself more time as their coach. Michael Strahan, who had a brilliant career with the team, but almost didn't play this year because of a contract dispute, was able to go out in a blaze of glory. They were now champions. It was a roller coaster of a season, but they never lost confidence. Criticism was coming from all angles, even from former players, but they just brushed it off and managed to beat the odds. Actually, after the Giants won the Super Bowl, guess who was on the field to do interviews? None other than former running back Tiki Barber. So after retiring, then criticizing the Giants in the preseason, Barber now had to interview his former team as they won the championship without him. Talk about full circle. Thanks for watching. This is the Building a Championship series. Subscribe for more content coming real soon.